Father God, I just pray for this house. I pray that we would have a heart that's burning. That we would pray for your glory to fall upon this land. That there would be a revival in our hearts. That we individually would be a dwelling place, a holy abode, a tabernacle for you to come and dwell richly inside of us. Inhabit our being and come and and fill each of us individually and collectively and may you unify our hearts. Give us one heart, one mind. And we pray, Father, that in all that we do and say, we would glorify you. Come and use me right now. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would remove any pride, arrogance, vanity, vain conceit, my own selfish ambition, or my own will. And may I simply be a conduit for you to speak to your people, including myself. So we welcome you with open hearts and minds to receive your word today. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Hi, Heritage. I missed you. It is good to be back in the house. So my whole family is, yeah, you can clap. All glory to God. Um, couldn't believe my family all cried it was, um, that there was a unanimous 100%. What? That's just... I'm humbled by that, and to serve Jesus alongside of you in the coming years is truly um, one of the greatest joys of my life. So um, I did want to tell you that um, I I just want to let you know I I put it out there, and I made our relationship Facebook official. I uh, I did I did that, and um, so I, I just want you to know I made it public. And whether you like it or not, we're sort of married to each other now. So if you're new around here, man, it is great to have you. My name is uh, Pastor Blake, and I I just want to welcome all of you. If you've never come to Heritage, man, we hope you already are going. I feel right at home, and I uh, feel like I have a family already, and and we want to help you get plugged in around here and and, uh, help you find your place. So um, it's, it's great to have you. So... Uh, the last couple of weeks, I I have been out traveling and speaking, but um, Pastor Aaron came and preached his heart out. He just brought the fire. Will you guys give him a hand? <laughs> Praise God. Did a great job, Aaron. Great job. So um, last week, I, I'll give you a quick update. I, I spoke in uh, Boca Raton the week before that. I was in uh, Plano, Texas, and finishing up some of the obligations and and commitments that I already have in preaching. And um, last week, uh, we, we had Mother's Day together as a family. Uh, we all went to the church there. It's called Victory Church. And they um, brought my whole family up on stage after I was done preaching. And they anointed me with oil. And uh, they prayed together as a church and sent me out in a big way. And so it was a major blessing to see them do that. And then after that, we went to P.F. Chang's, praise God. And... Um, uh, so we sat in a circle and all my girls went around the horn and told Allie how much they loved her and what they see in her as a mom. And everyone cried and it was very emotional and beautiful. Um, and then we went to the beach and um, my wife's heart was very full and it was a wonderful Mother's Day. Hopefully you guys all had an amazing Mother's Day as well with your people that you love And um, so anyways, I do want to tell you some things that I'd love for you to continue to pray for as I kind of live through this transition. I'd ask, uh, I have some specific things. Is that okay? Can I give you some specific ways to pray? I know you're praying people, so let's just get it out there. I'd love for you to pray for a contract on our house so we could sell it in Tampa. We'd love for that. I'd also love for you to pray for Montana's graduation party, which is next week. So I have a senior that's graduating, and we're going to celebrate her. Two of my daughters I'm leaving behind. They're staying in Tampa. My two oldest, uh, one's getting married. You guys met Tifton, and so they're going to stay there in their apartment, and my daughter Mariah is actually uh, staying there as well. She's, gonna, she's got an amazing job uh, as a kickboxing instructor. <laughs> so she's, she's a little scary. I'm very scared of her, actually. She's tougher than nails. So then I'd also ask that you would pray for me that I would finish well with the current responsibilities that I have 
and that fifth, you would, you would pray for supernatural wisdom and discernment as God leads me to, to teach and lead this church staff. And um, man, I, I just feel this overwhelming peace in the midst of all of it. It doesn't make sense, but peace that passes understanding that um, my whole family feels affirmed by God and loved by Him and have His favor. And um, lots, of, lots of love from the community of believers in our lives and from you. And so thank you for making us feel so loved and welcomed already. You've been such a blessing. So that's sort of um, me. It's enough about me. But today we're, we're continuing a series in, in a series called What Now? And in this series, we've been talking about how God takes our mess and he makes it our, let me see if you're listening. Anybody? He makes it our message. He takes our mess and he makes it our message. Another key statement that we've been saying through this series is that sometimes when things are falling apart, they're actually falling into place. Come on, that's good preaching right there. So it's often in our greatest challenges and pain, it's in the midst of that that God shows us who we really are. He helps us see uh, our own character, right? You have to persevere to find your own character. And in the midst of the struggle, we have to choose to persevere. And we can often get stuck there. When you are found yourself in the struggle and in the battle, sometimes you can get just stuck. And so it's during times like that that we really start to understand uh, what we really believe. Like uh, our faith gets really real, doesn't it? It's sometimes when you f- face cancer, right, guy? When you face it, all of a sudden you're like, I actually believe this stuff. <laughs> and so I, I, I've realized that a lot of times in our lives, it takes that kind of resistance training to know what you're actually made of and what you can press. And people don't typically laugh at God when they're at the hospital. They don't mock God when they're in a foxhole in the middle of a war, do they? It, when you're in the middle of it, it's times that you go, man, I actually, I'm going to get very real about wanting the presence and the power of God in our life. Have you ever, have you ever been there in a moment where you're like, now what? God, I, I need you right now. Have you ever had a this just got real moment. Maybe it was a moment that was serious, and it was a life or death. You got the diagnosis. Um, You found out you didn't get the job. Maybe it is uh, something like that, or maybe it was just a silly moment, and you, you know, built up the courage to finally ask her out, right, or something silly like that, or you, maybe it was one of those defining moments where you tripped on stage, or maybe you uh, did or did not stand in front of 700 pastors and preach an entire sermon with your fly down. Maybe, maybe that's happened to you. Oh, wait, no, that was me. And it got real. And my wife was mortified the whole time as I was preaching. So that is a true story. Another thing about my wife that I want to tell you a story about is that I um, went skiing in Frisco, Colorado. We were at Breckenridge. And... Um, we were coming down the mountain, and both of us uh, had drank a lot of water that day, and we both had to pee really bad. And so we, we get down to Frisco, if you guys know where that's at, it's a little bitty town outside of Lake Dillon, and we uh, went to the restroom, and we were like running to the restroom. We got there, and both the men's bathroom was taken, and the women's bathroom was taken. And so the only thing that was available was the family restroom. And we were like, hey, we're married, it's all right right? Don't judge. So we went into the family restroom together. Go to the restroom. We walk in this room and there is two toilets. It's a massive room that's completely open. No dividers, just two toilets, one adult and one child. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to give my bride the the big toilet. So I, I chose the little child's toilet beside her and we both sat down on two toilets together and this Right, we could have held hands. We didn't, but it was like that. It was that weird. And so, I'm sitting down on this little bitty <laughs> toilet, and she's done. Like, look at these splits. She washes her hands out the door. Well, my sweet wife, she did not lock the door. 
<laughs> and so here I am on this little bitty toilet in this room by myself. I'm not kidding. One of the most beautiful women, long blonde hair. She has this long red dress. She busts open and she has her little child with her. And she just like locks eyes with me and stares at me. And I'm staring at her. And I'm, we both have this moment. And I'm just like, I didn't know what to say. And so I'm just sitting there. And I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, she closes the door. And she was disgusted. And I called my wife on the toilet. I said, Honey, you did not lock the door. And she thought that was the funniest thing she's ever heard in her life. She thought that was the greatest story of all time. So it got real. It got very real. And that was way too real than you probably wanted to hear. But I know that there's a lot of things in this life that are heavy and have a lot of weight. But sometimes you just have to laugh. In the midst of your worry, fear, stress, anxiety, you just have to laugh because I don't know if you know this, but we as followers of Christ, we actually have joy. We were given joy. By God, it's a gift from Him. It's a fruit of our spirit. And so sometimes, man, we just have to laugh. We've all faced moments of like, man, now what? This is heavy. This is heavy. In major life moments, sometimes today, we, we feel like we, we've got to face life with this gusto and today I just want to talk about something that's a, a major thing in our society that we don't talk about a lot, and it's painful for a lot of people, and that's the challenges and the pain that come along with mental health. Mental health isn't something that the church speaks about and is really kind of quiet about, and I, I call this the pain of suffering in silence. People feel alone when they are suffering mentally. People feel alone and they choose isolation because they don't want to step back into it with other people because um, it's often seen as like, why, why are you so depressed? Like, you're just always sad. Why do you always have anxiety? And so it's one of those battles that we battle oftentimes alone. You, you choose to go to your quiet, dark place and you fight it alone, and, and that's not okay. This is really personal for me, because um, my, my own daughter, Montana, uh, had a, a year long, several years of battling anxiety, and it was debilitating for her, and it was a really hard battle in my home that I didn't really understand how it started or why she came out of it. Uh, it was just one of those things we went through as a family that was very, very hard. My own father um, he, he suffers from PTSD because he was in Vietnam and had Agent Orange and faced serious depression uh, for, from that and, and had a really hard time our whole life. So my whole life, I've understood the challenges of people being in mental anguish. I also recently lost one of my dear friends to suicide. Um, he, he was a pastor that served with me for years and he took his own life because of the mental anguish and battle that was going on with him. And I, I had no idea. And neither did his own wife. It just happened out of nowhere. Uh, he wrote a letter and he was gone. And it, he's a pastor. He's the one that, right? He gives hope to people. He helps people uh, feel set free. And yet he was completely bound up and this guy, if you knew him, he was contagious. He was full of life, full of joy, and nobody knew. When people are going through this kind of despair, the last thing we should ever say to them is, you know what, you need to just get over it. Because I promise you, they would if they could. Especially if they are followers of Christ and love Jesus and are disciples and have surrendered to Him completely and they've done the prayers and they've, they've had people, uh, you know, do all the anointing with oil and all of that and yet they still find themselves in mental anguish. And in my counseling meetings, I'm blown away by how many people come to me and, and 
how it feels like anxiety is all that I talk about. I've heard people call this actually the age of anxiety. Have you ever heard that? That um, we, we need to face this. I think as a church especially, we need, to talk, we need to talk about this. If there's any place in the world that should be a safe place to come and get healthy and find community that will listen, understand, and bring healing, it should be us. It should be us. Amen? You don't have to suffer alone. You're not alone. So let's break the silence. If you're hurting from any kind of mental health, I just want to tell you that, um, there, and that's a whole lot of different things, by the way. Let me just go through a list that you're like, oh, well, I, I do that. W- worry is a mental health problem. Fear is, do I have any worriers in the house? Yeah, okay. If you, if you uh, didn't raise your hand, then you probably just lied. Um, there's self-doubt. There's fear. There's insecurity. There's depression. There's uh, anxiety, there's bipolar, OCD, there's PTSD, mood swings, personality changes, there's social a- anxieties that we have, and addictions, and, and even psychotic disorders. Can I just say, if you're in any of those categories, it, it's okay. And I, I want to just say to you, church, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to come with your pain and struggles to the house of God and to share about it and talk about it. So let's stop with the quick judgments, okay? And I I think I'll just have you say this to the person beside you. Don't judge me just because your crazy is a little bit different than my crazy. Go ahead, say that. Don't judge me. So let's be vulnerable with one another and our problems and talk about talk about the things that we're suffering from. We're way more alike than we are different. And just because you struggle with one, one of those things that I just listed, it does not mean that you're crazy. We all got a little bit of crazy. And, and it's okay. But we, we are a family. And God calls us to be unified with one heart, one mind. One mind unified by his spirit and because we're a family in one body we bear each other's pain don't we we're we're called to carry each other's pain together you are not alone and in fact we have a real treat today i want you guys to hear a story of some people that are in this house that have suffered quietly uh, with this very thing for a long long time so Please welcome to the stage, Mark and Janet Jeffries. All right. So, I think we have water here. No, we don't. We'll just pretend. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great stage prop, right? So, are your microphones working? Let's make sure. Yeah, okay. So, Mark and Janet, thank you for coming today. Thanks for sharing your heart and story. I know this takes a lot of courage. And so, for you to come and do this, I know you've been praying and um, excited to talk about how God has used your story in in so many ways already. But I'm believing that today, you being vulnerable and sharing your story, God's going to use it even more. And so, I want to start by just asking asking you, how, how... did we get here? What, what were some of the defining big moments that happened when you both started to realize, man, what in the, like something is horribly wrong? Well, I'll start um, and just know that uh, time doesn't allow us to give it, uh, all the details, but we'd love to, if any of you have any uh, desire to, to meet with us, we'd love to share more details with you at another time. But uh, for us, uh, our journey started uh, a little over two, almost two and a half years ago. Uh, early 2017, um, I've struggled with some sleep issues in the past. Make sure I can see everybody here. Uh, but I've uh, really started to struggle with uh, sleep. Uh, this was the, the initial issue for me. Uh, either waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to go back to sleep, or just not going to sleep at all. And it literally went on for days upon days. 
And I can remember literally getting up and going into the office at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning because I couldn't sleep. And I thought, well, if I can't sleep, I'll at least go to the office and be productive. And, um, and so from there, it, uh, some other things that happened. My mom fell in January of 2017. She was 88. She broke her leg uh, and just below the, the kneecap and was in um, physical therapy, rehab, excuse me, for over three months. And so my dad, who was 92 at the time, needed full-time care. They've been married almost 70 years. And so all of a sudden, his primary caregiver is taken away from him, and uh, we became his primary caregiver. And so my brother and sister and I and Janet would uh, give him round-the-clock care, lived about an hour away. So we would take turns just going up there and you know, compound the sleep with not sleeping in your own bed and you know, out of routine, uh, the stress of that along with work and family and everything else that, that piled on just started leading to some uh, anxiety for me and some, uh, again, just, you know, the sleep issues compounded. Uh, I got to the point where I couldn't focus, uh, which was very strange for me, very uh, unusual, to the point where I couldn't focus at home, I couldn't focus at work. And so I remember approaching my boss and she asked, he said, hey, would you consider taking some time off? And I was very gracious, but hadn't considered that, but uh, welcomed that opportunity to take some time off. Initially, I figured it would just be for a little bit of time, uh, but during that time away uh, became the real challenge where I was completely isolated at home. Janet still had her life, and so she went on about her life, and I stayed at home. And I wasn't able to work because I was on short-term disability, so uh, it started to, that's when it really started to spiral down for me was being at home alone, still not being able to sleep, uh, stress and anxiety of taking care of both mom and dad at that time. Do you want to? Janet? We've been at this church, we've been at this church since 2001. And um, this is our church family. We have two boys, they're currently 24 and 21. And they're both, at the time of this, um, they were both at college in Athens, so they weren't too far away, thank goodness. Um, but if anybody knows Mark, which at the time I had known him for about 30 years, and he is the biggest encourager, he's very outgoing, friendly, loves to be with people, um, just loves sports, I mean just really an outgoing person. Like a stud at work, he's a brilliant <laughs> mind, like he's a pillar, You're, yeah. Yeah, he had been yeah. there for 25 years, I guess. Yeah. The, the time. So anyway, so yeah. So he started telling me that he couldn't think right. That, And I just kind of blew him off, honestly. I'm like, oh, you're fine. Um, but it really, well, he was like, I just have this brain fog. I just have, I, it's not clear. I can't process things. And, you know, I used to be in the same industry when I worked full time, so I kind of understand a lot of the lingo. And he was explaining to me how, you know, I'm supposed to tell them what to do, and I can't tell them what to do. And I'm like, yes, you can't. You've done. That's what you've been doing. I, I didn't. So, but it was February that year. He was doing the taxes, and he's like, I cannot add these numbers. Hmm. And that was really the wake up call for me that something wasn't right. That he could not do simple addition. So. Um, he went to his regular doctor and he's like, oh, yeah, you need some, let's put you on some medicine. So they did. And so we went from one doctor to another to different medicines to it takes four to six weeks to take effect. And then he would say to me, I just feel sad. And I'm like, well, it'll work out. We just got to give it some time. So that's what, um, you know, we just kind of kept saying, okay, we got to give it some time. But, um, so anyway, so that's kind of the, the background. Yeah. So there were some big moments where it got even worse than that, right? There were moments that wasn't just addition. Like it started spiraling even more where you're like, wow, I had no idea. Yeah. So um, I, as I reflect back on those days, I refer to those three months as hell. Yeah. But six weeks, we were in the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it began, I can remember that year, it was Easter weekend, <clears throat> and my boys were coming home from school on Friday, and one of Mark's favorite 
things to do was to go to the Stars Mill baseball game. Both mm -hmm. boys played baseball. And um, so I made them go to the baseball game and didn't realize how um, paranoid he was sitting there. And the, my oldest son had shown up during the game. And so he was sitting with us and friends were all around us, but he wasn't saying anything. But all, when the game was over, he disappeared, Mark disappeared. And I couldn't find him. And then I got my son involved and the lights were turned out. We could not find him anywhere. We didn't yeah. know where he went. And I was calling him, he wasn't answering. And finally, we found him at the intersection of Red Wine and 74, and he was scared to death. He was standing there shaking. He told me where he was, and he, that was the beginning, huh. because at that point, I went and picked him up, took him home, my other son came home, and then he took off running again. And so, they had to chase him down, and um, it was just a very, like, out of body, like, we were thinking, is he joking? Yeah. We didn't know if he was serious. Yeah, it's Mark. I mean, yeah. What yeah. are you doing, Mark? This yeah, isn't you, like, what? right? Yeah. But really just had this, it, it, it's got to be embarrassing. That's the thing about mental health a lot of times is you don't really want to talk about that there was gibberish and that I wasn't making sense. I literally was not in my, you know, my right mind. Yeah, right. not making sense. Yeah. And it, I have so many stories like that for the course of six weeks yeah it's just and the thing about it is he would snap out of it yeah and would be normal for a little bit and so we were questioning what was really going on and we, we would try to describe it to the doctors and they didn't understand yeah and we would even that weekend we even went to one of the mental hospitals and we waited for five hours and wow. when they got to us they interviewed him and he seemed totally normal so they sent us home. Mm -hmm. So when we got home, he went back out again, and he would pace, and he would just, um, he couldn't sit still. He would just walk constantly. Yeah. So we called the ambulance that night. And by the time the ambulance got there, he had stopped again. So It's so just, funny. It's like when you take your car to the mechanic, and it's like, it's making a clunking yeah. sound. Like, no, I can't hear it. And they send you home. You know, it's the same kind of, like, it when, just, when it was time to, like you were fine, yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. So during the season, uh, tell me about some ways that your community and some people that loved you helped you s sort of in that and all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, initially, we just let family and a few friends know. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't talk about it much at all. We were just like, well. I'm sure if we go to the doctor and get on the medicines and it's going to take effect, it's just going to take some time. Mm -hmm. And I can remember specifically my sister saying, can I share it with my life group and put it on the prayer list? And I'm like, no, no, let's don't say anything right now. Let's just kind of keep it yeah. quiet. It'll work out. Yeah. Um, Which is so common, by the way. I, yeah. As yeah. I reflect back on that, I'm like, why did I say that? Like, mm -hmm. is it pride? You know, what was I, why did I feel that way? Mm -hmm. Um and for me, um, the power of family during that time, um, even from a you know, different perspective for me or a jaded perspective or you know, cloudy perspective was very evident of the importance of family. And for my bride of 28 years at the time uh, to step in like she did, um, you talk about unconditional love uh, and an angel uh, that appeared and just totally put her needs aside and focused on me and getting wow. me well. Uh, my boys uh, were both rocks, uh, both in college at the time, but they would come home regularly, uh, not just to help me, but to provide support for Janet. Uh, my extended family, um, some of which are in this room right now, uh, just countless examples. But one of the things that stuck out for me that I still remember to this day was literally every day, regardless of what was on her calendar, because I didn't have anything on mine, was we would sit down on the couch in our living room, and she would pull out her Bible, and we would start the time with prayer. She would read through scriptures, daily devotions, 
lot of it, I think, was just in one year and out the other. It was just foggy to me. Sometimes it clicked, sometimes it didn't. But just that example of perseverance and tireless uh, self, uh, selflessness on her part, uh, pouring into me, uh, God's word, knowing and praying over me that eventually God would heal me. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah. looking back now, two years later, it's huge. So, Janet. Um, and I also would say, uh, you mentioned it earlier, Blake, the, the way that this church family yeah. stepped up during that time. And again, a lot of you uh, may not have even known, but those that did, um, the staff uh, came to our home numerous times, the elders, sometimes individually, uh, sometimes as an elder team. I'll never forget them leaving the house on Mother's Day and Lisa staying home with me and then all of a sudden Janet shows up and the boys show back up to the house and then I was w watching out the front door or window and one by one every elder and the senior pastor's car pulled up in front of our house. Every elder from this church walked in, laid hands on me and said collectively prayed for me and encouraged me hmm. and I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. The love that, and the outpouring uh, from our life group, uh, from other members of the church and the staff. Um, our, our small group was, and not just you know, phone calls, but visits and texts and meals and just go down the list. Mm -hmm. Just that uh, tangible support and outpouring of love. Wow. I can remember one of my friends calling and saying, my husband's home today, what can I... Can he come over and do something? Do you need something done around the house? Um, and eventually Mark did, um, was admitted to an inpatient facility, actually two different ones hmm. over the course of two weeks. And um, um, I came home one day and the yard was cut, the bushes were trimmed, and I was like, who did that? My neighbors had done it. So hmm. we'd never experienced needing to be on the receiving end of that mm -hmm. before. It was like we were always the one doing that right. with people. So that was the first time we had ever um, experienced the receiving end. So it was so important. So now this story is such a powerful story. Has God used it in ways in people in your life already? Have you started to get to help other people that are suffering from the same kind of thing? Absolutely, and I, I would tell you, uh, Janet mentioned I was uh, in the last mental hospital um, and about to, and I would meet with the doctors regularly every morning, and I was about to undergo this pretty radical uh, treatment that we were desperate at that point. Uh, they had also pre prescribed this particular medication for me. And I went to sleep that night in, in my hospital room, slept through the night, woke up the next morning, um, totally different feeling, walked out to meet with the doctors. She said before she even looked at me, she knew something was, was very different. And God had miraculously healed me that day. I have not been on any medication since Come then. on, come on. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Janet finish that story because I thought I was going to be there for a long time, and they said, you're going home. Yeah. yeah. Um, before he actually went to the hospital, I couldn't physically control him anymore, so that's why we had to have him taken away. And um, so, honestly, it was kind of a relief that I didn't have to, like, worry about his safety because I knew he was in a safe place. But... Um, but so when the doctor called me to say he was coming home, I was a little nervous because of what I had been experiencing before he left. And one of the phrases he used is that um, he had a rapid recovery. And so I was just like, okay. And he was explaining that his countenance on his face was different. He wasn't sad anymore. Um, and I just, I was just praying, okay, God, and sure enough, I picked him up that day, and he's been clear-minded and normal ever since. Wow. 
Wow. So I, I knew it. I felt it when we got home that he, yeah. everything was okay. So this is a now what, right? And so tell me, tell me how it's turned into a what now? Yeah, that, that seems like this is exactly what that, that is. Because now you're able to tell this story with boldness, right? And authority and help set other people free and bring peace and hope in the midst of despair, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And for us, as I mentioned, the power of prayer uh, and the outpouring of love from so many and the scripture verses uh, that people would share with us regularly. Uh, and the songs that we would hear on the radio that are still so special to us, uh, some that we would sing here uh, in worship on Sunday morning, some that we would hear on the radio. But uh, one particular for me that I wanted to share with you this morning is Psalm 40, uh, verses 1 through 3. And this is a psalm of David, but it so spoke to me, and maybe some of you can relate to this as well. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, mm. out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Wow. And I know you, Janet had some as well. All the ones you gave me, Janet, that's the rest of my sermon, so I'm preaching it. Don't, don't take it, anything. please. That's all I've got. But, um, <laughs> but we, did, we have had a couple of people come to us. It's like from friends telling other people who've been struggling that we've been able to meet with and talk about our journey and how the mental health community, the doctors, is just so such a difficult and confusing process. It's different than just walking into Fayette Piedmont. It's so different. And I didn't understand it at the time. I had gotten a big education. Um, it's just, so we've been able to help others. Not that we have the answers, but we can share our story because I think it's so complicated and everybody's situation is right. different. And so um, it was a lot of prayer. And I just feel like God opened doors. Once we started opening up to people mm -hmm. in our lives, the doors, God started opening doors for us. Mm -hmm. And I think staying isolated and quiet and not knowing what to do kind of kept us in this little state where we weren't moving forward. Mm -hmm. And once we started making ourselves transparent, it doors started opening for us. And that's what we want to share to others is don't, isolate yourself yeah talk to people get the help there is help mm -hmm. so you just need to um, talk about it and I would say for me my um, transformation from now what to what now was the encouragement of friends uh, specifically uh, our life group leader uh, Tim Fearbaugh and fellow elder that uh, said Mark you're a living miracle you've got a story to share share it and to Janet's point, I thought, okay, well, I can do that one-on-one. -on -one. And we had folks that knew about it, and we would share those uh, individually with those uh, friends. But I never envisioned, you know, being up on stage with my church family <laughs> sharing our story. But uh, when Blake, you know, shared uh, in his, one of his first messages, and we said it again this morning, that he wants to turn our mess into a message. And I said, I've got a message. Mm -hmm. And then when he said, and by the way, we're over at Fearbaugh's house one night after life group, and they showed up, Blake and Allie, and he said, hey, Mark, uh, would you be willing to share your story with our church family? And I kept picturing Tim in the background saying, yeah, you've got a story to share, share it. And so our thought was, yeah, one-on-one's -on -one's great, but if there's somebody here that is struggling with some of the issues that Blake mentioned, or you have a family member or a friend, that could benefit and that we could be able to speak into and share some of our story and revelations and how God healed us and strengthened our marriage, strengthened our family, gave us boldness. And uh, God put this scripture on my, uh, on my heart, um, 2 Corinthians 1, 4. He comforts us all in our troubles mm -hmm. so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. And so that's our prayer. Uh, it'd be real easy just to not say anything yeah, and kind of sweep it under the rug. 
but you know, God's not asking us to do that. It, uh, for us to be transparent and bold and vulnerable and to see this guy model that, the first time I met him, he mm-hmm. told us his whole story. It was very transparent. And I love a senior pastor that's willing to be transparent because we're all, we're all sinners. We're all in need of God's mercy and his grace, and he showered that upon our family so many times throughout this process, and we give him all the praise on it. Come on, come on. You guys, give him a hand. So good. Thank you, Janet. He's so good. Love you, Mark. Mm-hmm. Love you. You guys, get ready, because your ministry's fixing to explode. <laughs> Phone's fixing to start ringing. I just want to tell you that when you see somebody have the courage to be vulnerable like that, there's freedom, isn't there? The fear is, the fear is, if they knew, if you guys knew what's going on inside of me, you knew my crazy, you'd run. But the truth is, the more we're um, brought into each other's pain, and we connect with one another's pain, we love each other more. Because it's like, I get that. I understand that. Because all of us have our own Stuff we're working through. And so, um, how much time do I have? No, really, I want to know. It's 1130. Is, this, is it bound to shut this thing down? Okay. Man, I've got a lot of stuff to preach. Um, I'll just share two verses, and these are the ones that Janet really uh, were brought healing to her. The one is Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. So joy and peace is given to you as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is hope no matter how much despair you have. And first Peter says it, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand. You're under God's mighty hand, church. And so under God's mighty hand that you may be lifted up in due time. And then it says cast all, all, all your anxieties on him because what? He cares for you. God cares for you in the midst of your anxiety. So the the next part is be alert. I can just picture Peter grabbing a hold of the church, looking him in the eyes and saying, be alert and sober-minded. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy has a plan, and that's to, to devour you. Like a roaring lion, he's looking to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that your fellow believers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. We each have the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That verse was the one that helped bring healing to Janet in a major way. Gave her faith. And so I just want to tell, tell you that it's not our differences that divide us. It's our inability to recognize, accept, and even celebrate those differences that divide. Come on. So, so it's important that we see each other, that we recognize, man, in this world, everybody sort of feels this um, d- dulled and distracted mind. Technology is doing that. There's all kinds of studies that talk about how our mind is not sharp. We're so dulled by uh, constant, constant uh, texts and Facebook and Instagram messages and just me- media is just bombarding us. And so what consumes your mind controls your life. Learn to control your mind. God cares about what you think about. In, in Proverbs, it talks about how we think so a man is. Uh, God, God wants us to love, love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He wants us to have a clear mind that's sober, right? That's a mind that is directed by Him. And out of our mouth, we speak, right? The heart speaks, the mind speaks. And so it's important that what we speak and what we say and what we type on Facebook right? Then it's, it's directed by the Spirit of God. And I'll end with Philippians 4, because this is the verse, I think, that bring a lot of healing to people that are suffering from this kind of mental anguish, and that's don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Worry is the antithesis of faith. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything and tell God you need and thank Him for all He has done. 
then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand, and His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So God gives us a sound mind. He, he wants us to have a sound mind. And so I want to challenge you, church, to take every thought captive. When a thought comes in, you can say, no, that's not from the Lord, and you can direct it. What you feed will grow. If you feed worry, if you feed fear, and you let that stuff just spin out of control, it'll grow. But if you feed joy and peace and love and the things above, that will grow. So I just want to challenge you to stay firm, rooted in Christ Jesus, knowing that he is the only one that can give us hope. And he can and he does heal all of our wounds and our sorrows and our despair and our anxiety and our fears. In a second, in a second, right, Mark? In a second, he can make everything brand new. So you are not alone. God loves you. If you're facing thoughts of suicide and it's constantly on your mind, God loves you. He adores you and he has a plan for you. Don't lose hope.